Mr. President, uh, once after I had made a speech, my late friend Alex Haley, the author of Roots, Roots came up to me and said, uh, Lamar, may I make a suggestion? I said, well, of course. He said, when you speak, if you would say, uh, instead of making a speech, let me tell you a story, someone might actually listen to what you have to say. So I do have a little speech on the new health care law to make, but before I make a speech, let me, let me tell a story that I think applies to the new health care law. And it is a story about two famous and patriotic Tennesseans who went to Texas. The two men are Sam Houston and Davy Crockett. In the early part of the 19th century, Sam Houston was the governor of Tennessee. He resigned that position because of a problem with his marriage, went to Arkansas, lived with the Indians, and he went to Texas. Congressman Davy Crockett went for a different reason. He got crossways with President Andrew Jackson, who recruited a one-legged veteran of the War of 1812 to run against him, and he lost his race for Congress in 1835. He went to the courthouse steps in Madison County, Tennessee, and said what every defeated candidate has always wanted to say to such voters. He said, um, I'm going to Texas, and you can go to hell, and he went to Texas. That's historic. I'm not using bad words here. Uh, so we had these two famous Tennesseans, patriotic, brave men, both of whom went to Texas. They had the same goal in mind, the independence of Texas, but they had different tactics in mind. Former Congressman Davy Crockett said, I think I'll go to the Alamo. Some people said, Davy, if you go to the Alamo, you'll get killed. He went to the Alamo, he did get killed. And we remember him for his bravery and we remember the Alamo. Sam Houston took a different tack. He withdrew to San Jacinto. He was heavily criticized by some people in Texas at that time for withdrawing. Some said it was a retreat, but he waited until the Mexican general Santa Ana was in a siesta with his troops. He attacked him, defeated the troops, and he won the war. So today, Mr. President, we celebrate both men. We think of them both as patriots, great Americans, and we remember the Alamo, but we celebrate Texas Independence Day on March 2nd, 1836, because Sam Houston won the war. Now, the moral of the story is that sometimes, in a long battle, patience is a valuable tactic. And that's why I'm in Sam Houston's camp on this one. I'm not in the shut down the government camp. I'm in the take over the government camp and elect some more Republican senators and then a Republican president, and along the way, delay, dismantle, and replace the new health care law, which we call Obamacare, with a law that actually reduces health care costs for Americans. My reason for that first is that shutting down the government won't, won't work. Problem is that even if we vote, even if we were to shut down the government, uh, according to the way some people argue, and I understand their passion and I respect it, Obamacare would just keep going like the Energizer Bunny. The first reason, as Senator Coburn, a senator from Oklahoma, has pointed out, most of it's mandatory spending. That's the type of spending that just keeps going. So money for the exchanges, money for the subsidies, money's for the individual mandate. Senator Coburn estimated 85% of the funding for Obamacare would just keep going. So we, what would we have achieved? We'd have shut down the government, but 85% of Obamacare would just keep going. And if that's not enough, the president has the authority within the law to declare some services essential. I would assume that since this is his signature issue, and he's president for another, another three years, that he would declare most of Obamacare essential services. And so where, we would, be, where would we be? As long as we have a Democratic majority in the Senate, and President Obama in the White House. It takes 67 votes here in the Senate to repeal Obamacare. And we have 45, 46 today, on the Republican side. Every one of us have voted against Obamacare repeatedly. Every one of us would do so again. Every one of us would vote to repeal it. But in my view, the right tactic is not to shut down the government, because first it won't work, Obamacare would just keep going, and we would have shut down the government. Now, what does that mean? What does a government shutdown mean? Well, not everything would shut down, but here's some of the things that would or could happen. There are 3.4 million 
active duty military who would have to report to work, whether at Fort Campbell in Kentucky and Tennessee or in Afghanistan, without being paid for it, as long as the government shut down. And at home, their spouses would suddenly find the Department of Defense schools closed. So what are they going to be doing for child care and with a check arriving not at all or late to pay the mortgage? Social Security would continue to be paid, but the offices might be closed. More than 20 million of our veterans get disability payments. They might come late. Two million Americans fly every day. There would likely be fewer TSA agents, fewer air traffic controllers, long lines at the airports in Nashville and New York and Chicago. How do you think those two million people are, are going to feel about that? The national parks would, would close. Head Start might close. 110,000 people at our national laboratories. Many of them would be furloughed. Last time the government shut down 20 years ago, 200,000 people applied for passports, couldn't get them. There are 200,000 Tennesseans going to college this fall who want or are in the process of getting a new student loan. They might not get it, at least on time. Your gun permit might not come through. Neither might your FHA loan. And the last time we had a government shutdown, it cost the taxpayers $1.4 billion extra dollars, according to the Congressional Research Service. So one reason I'm in the Sam Houston camp on this, and I want to show a little patience in terms of trying to win the war, is that if we shut down the government, Obamacare keeps going, it costs the taxpayers a lot of money, and inconveniences most Americans, which leads me to the last reason it's a bad idea. Who do you suspect is going to get blamed for this? We will have succeeded in shifting the blame for a passing Obamacare from the Democrats, who did it unanimously, to the Republicans for shutting down the government. Now, you'd think the Democratic National Committee might have come up with that idea, not the Republican National Committee. That might not be a good public policy reason to take a position here, but it is a fact, and people all over the country are observing it. And then there's some who say, well, to be a conserv good conservative, you've got to vote to shut down the government. I've been listening to these people who, who define who is a good conservative and who isn't a good conservative. It's a little, bit, a, bit, a little bit like being in Sunday school and somebody new comes into class and says, I'm a better Christian than you are. And if you don't agree with me, get out of the church. You might say, well, grandma's a Quaker and Uncle Sam's a Baptist. And, you know, we all try pretty hard in our, in our faith. It's really not up to us to judge which one of us on the Republican side is a better conservative than another. Uh, anybody who looks around knows that among Republicans, most of us are conservative, but we have many different kinds of conservatives. We have neoconservatives, we have paleoconservatives, we have fiscal conservatives, we have social conservatives, we have cultural conservatives, we have Ross Perot conservatives. We've opened the door over the last 40 years to every kind of conservative, and it's made our party bigger and more successful and more conservative because we've tolerated points of view. So I'm not for shutting down the government. For all those reasons, it won't work. Last time it was shut down 20 years ago, the congressmen couldn't buy their plane tickets back to Washington fast enough to open up the government because the voters were absolutely outraged. It will shift the blame for Obamacare, which ought to be the issue and ought to be the referendum in 2014, are you for it or against it, to Republicans, should you shut down the government or not shut down the government. And we shouldn't be in this business of saying, I'm a better Christian than you are, or I'm a better Jew than you are, or I'm a better conservative than you are. We ought to respect each other's point of view. Instead, what should we do? Well, first, Mr. President, we ought to delay the implementation of the new health care law. Now, my colleague from Tennessee, Representative Marsha Blackburn, I've never heard anybody question her conservative credentials, and Senator Jeff Flake from Arizona, wrote an editorial the other day, and I asked consent that it be put in the record following my remarks. Without, that without objection. The law must be delayed. Without objection, so ordered. And there's good reason for that. The President's already delayed many provisions of the health care law. It's coming too fast. Uh, the Chairman of the Finance Committee said it's going to be a train wreck. Uh, the logical thing to do is delay it for a year. The employer mandate has been delayed for a year. The requirement that insurance companies report to the IRS information about health insurance products has been laid, delayed for a year. Uh, the ability for employers to provide employees with multiple health insurance plan options 
to their employees in something we call the shop, small business shop exchange has been delayed for a year. The ability for state Medicaid programs to send electronic notices to beneficiaries, that's delayed for a year. The start of the basic health program, delayed for a year. Other provisions have been delayed for a year, including regulations that the administration has simply not had time to issue. So why not delay the entire program for a year? That would give the administration time to at least get ready for the program, and it would give the American people a chance to have a referendum on the program in the year 20, 2014. So that's the first thing we could do. The second thing we could do is begin to dismantle the program. And by that, we should repeal all of the job killing, premium hiking taxes, especially the medical device tax, a particularly onerous tax that's on 2.3% on, on the revenues of those companies that drives up the cost of medical devices that tens of millions of Americans use. And repeal the mandates on individuals, families, and job creators that drive up premiums. But that is not all we should do. That is not all we should do. We have a responsibility to say what we would do as Republicans if the voters were to trust us with the government, if they were to give us six more senators who would vote to just delay, dismantle, repeal, and change Obamacare, what would we do with it? Or if they were to give us in a couple of years a Republican president, what would we propose? We can do a pretty good job of saying what we don't like about Obamacare. Three years ago, I was asked by Senator McConnell and Speaker Boehner to lead off for the Republicans at the president's health care summit. And I took the opportunity to outline for the president some of the problems that we saw at that time. Turned out that we were pretty prescient in what we were doing because most of the problems we predicted have, have happened. More subsidies, more spending, more taxes, we said. A 2,700-page bill, more or less. Probably a lot of surprises in it, we said three years ago. It will cut Medicare by a half trillion dollars and spend most of that on new programs, not making Medicare stronger, even though Medicare is going broke within a several years, according to the Medicare trustees, and people won't be able to depend on Medicare. It means there'll be about a half trillion dollars of new taxes, we said. It means for millions of Americans, premiums would go up and the newspapers are filled with stories of rising premiums today. So that is what we said at the President's Health Care Summit three years ago, but we said something else. We said we have an obligation to say what we would do instead. And I said to the president at that time, Mr. President, the, the, the president's, your health care law, your proposed law, is an historic mistake because it expands a health care delivery system that already costs too much instead of taking steps to reduce the costs of that health care delivery system. It is a mistake because it attempts to be comprehensive and it's too big, too big a bite to chew, too much to digest, too much to swallow at one time. That's turning out to be right. That's why we have all these delays. So we suggested, in addition, Mr. President, why don't we go step by step to begin to reduce health care costs? And we suggested at the President's Health Care Summit, working with him in a bipartisan way to do that. We can still do that. We can delay it. We can dismantle the parts I talked about. And then what do we do? Step one, make Medicare solvent so seniors can depend on it. Senator Corker and I have a proposal which will do that, offer seniors more choices, at the same time reduce the federal debt by several hundred billion dollars. Medicare needs to be solvent because we have many Tennesseans who depend on it to pay their hospital bills, and it's going broke in a few years if we don't take steps to do that. Number two, give governors more flexibility with their state Medicaid programs. Medicaid's gone from 8% of the state budget when I was governor in the 80s to 26% today. It's soaking up money that ought to go to higher education. Governors would like to keep tuitions from going up higher. The main reason they're going up is federal Medicaid mandates. Make Medicaid more flexible. I said when the health care debate was on that every senator who votes for it ought to be sentenced to go home and serve as governor for two years to try to implement this law. Now they're trying to do that. That may be one reason we have 30 Republican governors and they're having a hard time doing it. Number three, I thank the president. 
Uh, number three, step three, strengthen innovative workplace wellness programs. The administration has a regulation that needs to be repealed that restricts the ability of employers to say to employees, if you live a healthy lifestyle, you can have lower insurance premiums. That's what we should be doing, so that's step three. Number four, let small businesses pool their resources and offer lower cost insurance plans for their employees. Number five, provide families the opportunity to purchase insurance across state lines. Number six, expend access to health savings accounts and catastrophic catastrophic health insurance plans, that would give people an opportunity to buy cheaper insurance rather than more expensive insurance. Number seven, incentivize the growth of private health insurance exchanges. Number eight, make it easier for patients to compare prices and the quality of doctors. Number nine, incentivize states to reform junk lawsuits. Now, Mr. President, there are two ways, one way to delay Obamacare, two ways to dismantle it, and nine steps to take to move from expanding a health care delivery system that already costs too much to introducing more choice and competition into our health care delivery system with the goal of reducing costs for most Americans. That is a program. That is an agenda. That is a plan that will earn the confidence of enough independent voters in Tennessee and other states across this country to elect more Republican senators or Democrats if they agree with us, that will give us a chance to dismantle, delay, and repeal the health care law, which was an historic mistake. So, Mr. President, this is nothing new. We counted it up. We mentioned 173 times in the health care debate our step-by-step -step plan to reduce health care costs. We stand ready still to put it into place. And the best way to do it is not to shut down the government. The best way to do it is to take over the government. Take over the government. Elect some more senators. Elect a president. Put in a bill. That's our constitutional system. We all admire the Constitution. We carry it in our pocket. We talk about it. We have a constitutional system. We have to follow those rules if we want to make legislative changes. So I greatly respect the passion and the endurance of those senators who argue that we should shut down the government if we don't get our way immediately on the health care law. I respect that. Just as I remember the Alamo and I respect our great Tennessee and Davy Crockett who went to Texas. But on this one, when it comes to tactics, I'm in General Sam Houston's camp. I think we're not going to have to show some patience to win the war. In the meantime, to win the war, let's delay Obamacare. Let's dismantle it. And let's show the American people that we have a better plan, better steps to replace what's in the law now with step by step by step to reduce the cost of Americans' health care. That's the plan that I'm voting for today and for the rest of this week, for the rest of this year and next year until we get the job done. I thank the President. I yield the floor.